Krivar fights for its life, they're trying for another ceasefire. ITN's David Chater is shot and seriously wounded. Three UDR battalions mobilized to stop Ulster violence. Dublin frees a self-confessed IRA man. And Mrs. Maxwell insists her husband's death was an accident. Good evening. Yugoslavia's Federal Army and the Breaker Republic of Croatia agreed to a new ceasefire tonight, but they're still fighting in several areas across the country. The agreement to end it, the 13th ceasefire, is due to take effect at 6 o'clock tomorrow evening. Today, the fighting in Croatia was especially fierce in the key town of Vukovar, which has been under siege now for 85 days. It was there earlier today that ITN's reporter David Chater was shot in the back and seriously injured. He and his camera team had been with federal troops taking part in the battle for Vukovar. ITN's producer in Belgrade, Andrew Tilly, sent us this report. They've been fighting in Vukovar for three months. It's a terrifying place where everyone feels he's constantly in the sights of the sniper, the lone gunman who sits patiently for hours waiting for his prey. The Federal Army are slowly taking more and more of the town. They say this graveyard was the front line today. A single shot from a Croatian gunman and the Serbian troops respond with a barrage. Hundreds of rounds in the general direction of where the shot was fired. And across the front line, a rifle grenade. It's a frightening, exhausting daily grind, and it shows on the faces of the mainly conscript army, soldiers who were told the town would fall in days, who've been here for months. Terrifying, too, for the residents of the town. They've been in cellars for months, feeding on each other's fears of what the enemy will do to them. More die every day, but neither side will reveal the casualty figures. David Chater and his crew moved into an area taken by the federal troops only hours earlier. They were filming a Serbian gunman when they came under fire. <laughs> the team moved into a church when the sniper fired again, hitting David in the back. He was fully conscious and talked to the soldiers who came to his aid. Then, coming under more sniper fire, the rescuers ran for safety. Into the ambulance and on to the military hospital in Belgrade. Andrew Tilly, News at 10, Yugoslavia. Tonight, David Chater is in intensive care in the military hospital in Belgrade. He's undergone a five-hour operation and doctors say his condition is serious but not critical. David, who's 38 and married, has worked for ITN for 13 years. The camera crew who were with him, John Martin and John Boyce, were both unhurt. They are now also in Belgrade. Croatia has again told Serbia that it will lift its blockade of Federal Army barracks inside the Rebel Republic. It wants all the troops out by Christmas. A United Nations peacekeeping force could be sent to Yugoslavia. The UN Special Envoy, Mr. Cyrus Vance, is on his way there to discuss the possibility. A local ceasefire in the Adriatic port of Dubrovnik has mainly held today, but shots were fi fired near a hydrofoil chartered by the United Nations Children's Fund to evacuate sick youngsters from the besieged city. And another Adriatic port split has come under fire from Federal Army gunboats. It was a surprise attack. Yugoslav Navy warships began shelling split just after dawn while most of the town was sleeping. The targets appeared indiscriminate. The apparent objective to terrorize the residents. The old Roman palace of the Emperor Diocletian took several direct hits. It's been resisting attacks since 300 AD. From this hilltop under their flag, the Croatians returned fire close enough to force this warship to take evasive action. With battle now joined, the warning siren sent people sprinting for the shelters. These people have seen what's happened to Dubrovnik. Now they fear it may be their turn. In the harbor, this ship was hit by a Navy shell. On deck, covered in white now, the bodies of two men who had no time to run and hide. 
From their hotel roof, two EC monitors watched, dismayed at yet another example of just what's happening in this civil war. For two hours, the bombardment of Split continued as the defenders stepped up the counterattack. The two warships finally gave up and steamed away. There's an uneasy calm at the moment, but few believe they've seen the last of the Yugoslav Navy. As a result, the ferry boat Slavia, which was due to dock here with thousands of refugees from Dubrovnik, now can't find a safe haven here. It's sailing further up the coast of Yugoslavia, trying to find somewhere to unload its passengers. Ken Reese, News at 10, Split, Yugoslavia. Here, hundreds of extra troops have been drafted onto the streets of Northern Ireland to counter the upsurge in sectarian killings. Seven men have been murdered there in the last 48 hours. Today, part-time soldiers from three UDR battalions were called up for full-time duty. The Army called it a short-term measure to cover the weekend. A senior security source today described the situation in Northern Ireland as a form of suppressed civil war. Preparing to go full-time on the streets of Belfast tonight, Ulster Defence Regiment soldiers who until today's announcement have been part-timers working in civilian jobs and undertaking military duties in their spare time. Around 1,400 men have been mobilised, soldiers from three battalions of the locally recruited regiment. Their role will be to support extra police patrols, and the army emphasises this is a short-term measure to try and thwart the upsurge in violence here. The UDR is overwhelmingly Protestant and deeply unpopular with nationalists who cite cases of harassment and the dismissal of some soldiers convicted of paramilitary crime, including murder. The UDR is a loyalist militia. It has failed. It's going to be abolished next year. And the people in England heard that a Serbian reservist group was going to be sent in to keep the peace in Croatia. I think they would be amazed. Unionist MPs, while welcoming the UDR move, say it isn't enough. I, I still think we should have two battalions of the uh, British Army, our own army as well, full-time battalions should be brought in as well. And I believe that there should be uh, uh, bringing uh, full-time all of the part-time men, all of them, all right across the province to start and deal with this matter once and for all. Around 200 extra regular army troops have been redeployed onto the streets of Belfast today, but it's unclear whether any large-scale reinforcements will be flown in from the UK mainland. The extra UDR cover will be deployed in Belfast, its outskirts and Craig Avon, where loyalist gunmen from the outlawed Ulster Volunteer Force shot dead three men. The victims were workers driving home from a late-night shift. Gunmen opened fire on one car, hitting two Catholics, Fergal McGee, aged 28, and 43-year-old Desi Rogers died. Protestant John Lavery, who was in a car behind, was also shot and died later in hospital. The factory where the men were employed, which has a mixed Protestant Catholic workforce, closed as a mark of respect. The closure of the factory today, as far as we're concerned, the workers, is a protest to the government and the politicians to get out there and do something about it. We're just sick of this. People being packed out, going to our work. And what else can we say? And the ruin of a church in a village near Lisbon, which police believe was set on fire by loyalists just after the shootings, was yet another pointer to the depth of hatred endemic in a small violent minority engaged in revenge killings. Tonight in Belfast, after seven deaths in the space of 36 hours, the city is preparing for the funerals tomorrow morning of the four Protestants shot dead by the IRA on Wednesday night. In keeping with the intensive police operation now going on, there's likely to be heavy security at the funerals. Andrew Simmons, News at 10, Belfast. The Irish Supreme Court has set free an IRA man wanted in Northern Ireland on an arms charge. It refused to extradite Anthony Sloan because he'd already served a jail sentence in the Republic and it upheld an earlier ruling that the arms charge had political motivations which prevented extradition under Irish law. The Irish Justmin Justice Minister, Mr Ray Burke, has promised a review of the legislation. Anthony Sloan's release is another political embarrassment in the long-running sore over Anglo-Irish extraditions. Supported today by leading anti-extradition campaigner Paddy Ryan and Desi Ellis, himself acquitted by the Old Bailey on terrorist charges, Sloan argued that his motives for possessing a machine gun were political under Ireland's 1987 Extradition Act. Ireland's Chief Justice said the Act specifically said using a machine gun was not political, but simply possessing one could be. Sloan had escaped from Belfast Kremlin Road Jail while serving a sentence for the possession and for unlawful imprisonment. Sloan's case succeeded because the court upheld an earlier ruling that the possession of a firearm could be construed a political offence and that he'd already served enough time here in the Republic of Ireland to cover the sentence for the second offence 
that of the unlawful imprisonment of a prison officer. Afterwards, Sloan, whose voice we cannot transmit under the broadcasting regulations, pledged he'd now campaign against any future extraditions. Past cases like that of Dermot Finucane and James Clark have failed on technicalities. The 1987 Act was supposed to tighten those loopholes. The Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Brook, will raise this apparent new flaw in Ireland's laws as a matter of urgency at next week's Anglo-Irish Conference. The Irish government had, had, had advised us that we should not press them to change the legislation until we saw the outcome of these cases. The fact that the outcome of these cases causes us to press uh, for the change in the legislation uh, does necessar it necessarily means it's a, it's a bad, bad development. In Northern Ireland, unionist politicians were furious that an IRA man should walk free. Well, I think Mr. Brooks has got to go in spitting fire uh, next week to the Republic of Ireland and make it quite clear that this is an unacceptable state of affairs. Another Kremlin jail escaper, Michael McKee, also won his appeal against extradition, though he's already in RUC custody. But a third convicted murderer, Paul McGee, was ordered to be extradited, but he's still on the run. An arrest warrant was issued. Even as Anthony Sloan was walking to freedom this afternoon, the Irish Justice Minister promised that he would review the law and change it if necessary. Jonathan Munro, News at 10 in Dublin. Inflation's gone down again. It's now at its lowest rate for more than three years. The October figure is 3.7%, down by almost a half of 1% on September. But the fall wasn't as big as the Chancellor, Mr Norman Lamont, had hoped. And he's warned that inflation could go up again for what he called technical reasons. The cost of motoring, the cost of making a phone call and the cost of posting a letter, all these combine to keep the inflation rate higher than expected. Petrol is the chief reason that inflation has fallen. It's cheaper now than it was a year ago when in the wake of the invasion of Kuwait, oil prices soared. My advice is don't be fooled. This problem isn't licked yet. We still have higher inflation in both Germany and France. Prices are still going up. The Germans are not only better at coping with inflation, uh, but they've better unemployment figures and they've better growth records, even despite the fact that they're now having to tackle the unique problems of reunification. Talk of Germany touches a raw nerve. Last month, Mr Lamont said he'd soon be the first Chancellor in years to bring British inflation below Germany's. He'll be disappointed it didn't happen today. All Chancellors look enviously at the German Bundesbank with its record second to none in controlling inflation. From the rubble of the Second World War, Germany emerged determined to defeat inflation. So while in the early 50s in the UK, inflation under Clement Attlee took off, then began to ease, in Germany, prices were falling, what's called deflation. And the 50s ended with Harold Macmillan saying, you've never had it so good. UK inflation was lower than 1%. Germany's much the same. During the 60s, with German industry booming, inflation rates weren't far apart. 1967 was the last time the UK was below Germany. But in the Wilson years of the 70s, inflation climbed way above Germany. Under Margaret Thatcher, it fell, but still above German levels. Then German Monetary Union pushed up German inflation. Now the two are almost level pegging. As long as we remain in the European exchange rate mechanism and persist with a firm exchange rate, there's no reason to believe that our inflation performance won't stay in line with theirs more or less indefinitely. Our first priority is to maintain the pound in its position within the uh, ERM. And we obviously have more flexibility, have had more flexibility as inflation has come down. But we've got to look at both factors together and give priority to maintaining the currency. But maintaining the currency means keeping interest rates high. So high the economy may not accelerate out of recession as quickly as the Chancellor wants. A Labour MP today called for a government statement on allegations that Robert Maxwell was murdered because he said, dead men tell no tales. But in her first television interview, Mrs Maxwell tells ITN she's sure her husband's death was an accident. A report next. Plus, Mr Major's battle plan for the Commons debate on Europe. And the British Communist who finally admits what everyone else always suspected, that they were bankrolled by Moscow. That's in a couple of minutes.
The Labour MP, Mr George Galloway, has demanded a government statement on the death of the publisher, Mr Robert Maxwell. He told the House of Commons that he wanted the government to comment on speculation that Mr Maxwell may have been murdered because, as he put it, dead men tell no tales. In her first television interview since her husband died ten days ago, Mr Maxwell's widow has told ITN she's sure his death was an accident. Mrs Elizabeth Maxwell said all the speculation about the circumstances was hurtful. Surrounded by reminders of her dead husband, Mrs Maxwell said he loved being on his yacht alone. When she first heard he was missing, she thought he was playing a joke, and she denied he was overstressed with worries. Obviously, I knew things were tough. Economic uh, circumstances are difficult for everybody, and I knew that we were not uh, different from anyone, and in fact, obviously, uh, because of the uh, the debts, it was uh, it, it was uh, a problem. But um, he was very angry, I think, with all the accusations, which are, of course, totally baseless. I mean, some of them are are so absurd. I mean, you know, one day they make him a KGB agent, the next day he's a Mossad agent, the third day he's a CIA agent. The poor man, I mean, he, he would have had a life dedicated to spying, you know. And when you think of what he pushed into his life, where on earth would he have found the time? For the first few days after the tragedy, she barely realized what had happened. Even now, it was difficult to come to terms with the manner and suddenness of his death. I'm waiting, hoping that the autopsy will tell us what was the cause of the accident. An accident it was, whatever the accident was. And um, I hope that they will be able to tell us more uh, of what were the last hours of, of his life. Do you have a wife's instinct for, for, for what happened? No, I really haven't any idea because it's just so unlike anything that I ever thought would happen to him that I, I can't even fathom things, you know. I can't understand it. Do you find the speculation hurtful? Yes, because... Um, when one has a, a bereavement like this, eventually um, the great healer is the time. Even an hour, two hours, one day, two days, a week, two weeks, eventually life takes over. And in a case like this, um, it, it won't let it happen, you know? One has to have this perpetual mud thrown at, at him, which is very, very unpleasant. Oh, he's left a, a big gap in your life, in every sense of the word. What, what's the worst of it for you? Well, he was... Um, he had an extraordinary presence. And the, his absence is already a very great silence, you know. Life, life is... Uh, without him, somehow, life is cold out there. Mrs. Maxwell said her hope now was that her sons could be left free to carry on the business and that Robert Maxwell could rest in peace. Norman Rees, News at 10, in Oxford. French President François Mitterrand said today if there is no agreement on economic and monetary union at next month's summit in Maastricht, the European community could begin to break up. Here, the government tabled its motion for next week's two-day Commons debate on Europe. It's carefully worded to attempt to unite both wings of the party before the summit. Labour said the motion was half-hearted. While John Major is meeting farmers' representatives today, party bosses were putting the finishing touches to a motion which they hope will unite all but the real die-hard Eurosceptics. It certainly includes something for nearly everyone, saying the government wants to be at the heart of the European community. And while it endorses the constructive negotiating approach adopted by the government, significantly it also urges them to work for an agreement at Maastricht, which avoids the development of a federal Europe. The new chairman of the key Tory backbench committee on Europe believes it'll meet most objections. The vast majority of the Conservative Party, inside the House of Commons and outside the House of Commons, would support this motion. I think there is no question of that whatsoever. It may even go far enough for Mrs Thatcher, who, as an official standard bearer of the Tory Eurosceptics, repeated her anxieties about giving too much power to Brussels last night in the United States. She said, I do not think we should ever allow the Commission to take more and more powers. To me, removing the people's rights to control at the ballot box is wrong, and I shall fight it. The motion is carefully constructed to hide more than it reveals. 
and it is clear evidence that the thing that the Prime Minister is chiefly concerned about is the appeasement of a very small number of his own right-wingers, not the best interests of the country in Europe in the future. As for Labour, its amendments stressing a positive commitment to Europe will flush out its own Eurosceptics. There are a few people in the Labour Party, indeed in the country, who hold strong, passionate views about one of the biggest issues of our time. But on the broad issues, the Labour Party has a consensus position and has, doesn't have to go to this length to cover over the cracks in its own party. There are bound to be some Tory MPs who are unhappy that this motion simply isn't specific enough in its opposition to ideas like a single currency or a federal Europe. However, the government must be hoping that the motion is general enough to attract the support of the vast majority of Conservative MPs and that any rebellion will be very limited. Mark Webster News at 10, Westminster. A man who forced his wife to have sex at knife point was jailed for six years at the Old Bailey today. He's the first husband to appear in court after a House of Lords ruling that rape within marriage is illegal. Today's case at the Old Bailey came just 23 days after the House of Lords overturned a 250-year ruling and decided that a husband can be guilty of raping his wife. The husband in today's case, who can't be named for legal reasons, admitted two violent sex attacks upon his 26-year-old wife. The couple had been living apart, but when she refused an offer of reconciliation, he bound and gagged her, threatened to kill her with a kitchen knife, and then raped her. Sentencing him to six years in prison, Judge Kenneth Richardson said, I'm prepared to accept that you may have believed that you were entitled to have sex with your wife as the law then stood against her will. But I do not believe for one moment you considered that you were entitled to use the violence you did to achieve that end. The man actually changed his plea to guilty within two days of the law lords finally saying that rape in marriage is a crime in this country. And many, many other men uh, must know that they're raping, must have known for a long time, but because the law has actually sanctioned that and said that it was all right to do it, they haven't admitted it. And we think that a lot more men will be admitting what they're doing now that the law is beginning to take the woman's side. And campaigners hope that will mean more wives seeking justice in court. Harry Smith, News at 10 at the Old Bailey. Just one soccer result tonight in an upset for third division Fulham in the first round of the FA Cup. They've gone out to non-league Hayes. The result, Fulham nil, Hayes 2. And tonight's main news again. A new ceasefire has been agreed in Yugoslavia to come into force at 6 o'clock tomorrow evening. Federal troops are close to capturing the wrecked town of Vukovar. While reporting the fighting there, ITN's David Chater was shot in the back and badly injured. And in Northern Ireland, hundreds of part-time members of the Ulster Defence Regiment have been called up for full-time duty to counter the upsurge in sectarian violence. Finally, what's left of the British Communist Party has been expressing shock and dismay at the news that everyone else has taken for granted for years, that they were funded by Moscow. The party here has always denied it. But a retired official has now said he laundered wads of cash donated by the Soviets. Former senior Communist Party official Ruben Falber has at last revealed the secret he's kept for decades, how he was the link between the British Communist Party and their Moscow paymasters. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Britain remained in the grip of a series of strikes amid suspicions of communist subversion and accusations at the highest level of financing by Moscow gold, accusations finally confirmed with the demise of the Soviet Communist Party and the seizure of party documents. The deal was masterminded by British party boss John Gollan, seen here with Leonid Brezhnev. Ruben Falber would meet a contact from the Soviet embassy in a London street. I would be given a message, asked if I could be at a particular spot, usually a, a street in London, anywhere in London, at a particular time. A bag would be handed over to me and that was that. They received up to £100,000 a year. That's worth around a million nowadays. One former Russian spy who came in from the cold has revealed the locations of secret dead letter boxes like this one in central London, where KGB agents could collect the money from Moscow. Well, it wasn't that professional, but there it was. I was an amateur, not a bit like John Le Carre. Falber's revelations have shocked the Communist Party, which, with a plummeting membership, meets next week to change its name. 
Well, I was shocked, dismayed and angered to find that the party which I believed to be an independent British party had actually been covertly bankrolled by the KGB for many years. But in Moscow, funding British communism was never seen as particularly productive. It was a complete waste of time and a complete waste of hard currency. It may have been small fry for the Kremlin, but it's an embarrassing piece of history for Britain's communists, who had depended, it seems, not only on reds under the beds, but also on rubles under the mattress. On Wall Street, the Dow has just closed down 120 points, its biggest fall for two years. That's news at 10 tonight. From Julia and from me, good night and have a good weekend. <laughs>